The rain came down in curtains, turning the city streets into rivers and the towering buildings into canyon walls. Lightning flashed occasionally through the darkness, reflecting off windows and briefly illuminating the cityscape in sickly hues. The thunderclaps that followed shook the ground under my feet as I trudged back to my unmarked squad car. As I walked, my baseball cap keeping the rain out of my eyes, I paid close attention to the storm drains. They were struggling to funnel all the rain down off the streets, given the immensity of the downpour. I don't know what drew my attention to the alley as I passed. Maybe it was the flash of lightning at the perfect moment. Maybe it was a flash of movement I saw out of the corner of my eye. Whatever it was, I found myself peering at a huge figure cloaked in black. He was hunched over, a petite woman held in his hands, her feet a full foot off the ground. She was limp, head lolling. It was as if she weighed nothing at all. The man wore a hood, and his eyes seemed to glow as they stared at me from that dark oval, the rest of his face obscured by rain and darkness. I froze in mid-step as the gears groaned in my overworked mind. Don't move, I shouted. The man dropped the woman and bolted away from me down the alley. I was running before the woman's body came to rest on the soaking alley floor. As I ran after him, I pulled my pistol out from my hip holster, shouting again for him to stop. Police! I yelled as he turned the corner on the next block. He moved with a natural fluidity that reminded me of a talented athlete, but I was a runner too. I had the medals from college to show for it. He led me into a part of the city populated by warehouses and old tenements. I kept up with him, not gaining and not falling behind. I watched him turn into an abandoned tenement. By the time I made it through the boarded up door, I saw an interior doorway just ahead, falling closed on its own. Bolting through that door and then down a set of stairs, I soon found myself in a basement, surrounded by impenetrable darkness. Stopping at the bottom of the stairwell, I reached into the pocket of my raincoat and found my flashlight. The only sound other than rainwater dripping off my clothes was my heavy breathing. I clicked on my flashlight and shone it around. The light revealed brick walls and scraps of trash here and there. Next to an archway on the opposite side of the room, there was a piece of an old wooden headboard propped against the wall. I turned my attention to the archway. As I shone the light through, the dark, hulking figure rushed past, caught in my light for the briefest of moments. Come out here now with your hands up, I called. The basement reeked of death. I knew without a doubt that this was the man I'd been looking for. He was the reason I'd been out in the rain at such a late hour. He'd been killing people all across the city, leaving them drained of blood. A few of my coworkers joked that I was looking for a vampire. I knew better. I had no doubt that this person wanted to be a vampire. Maybe he even drank the blood when he got it out of them. But I was sure he wasn't sticking fangs into their necks to drink their blood. I didn't know how he was getting it out of his victims, but I would find out soon enough. The idiot had cornered himself in a basement, and the rotting smell told me he likely had some victims' bodies down here. Edging toward the doorway, I called out again. Give it up. I'm not in the mood for this shit. Not tonight, asshole. As I got closer, I could see that the room beyond the archway was slightly wider than the one I was in. When I was six feet away from the entrance, the figure stepped into my flashlight beam, back near the far wall. His head was down, the hood obscuring his face. Good, I said. Now put your hands. Another dark figure stepped into the light, and then another, and another. There were four of them, and they were all identically dressed, all wearing large black cloaks. The words stuck in my throat. I realized I hadn't used my rover to call for backup. Stupid. As I was regaining my ability to speak, all four figures snapped their heads up in unison, revealing gruesomely elongated and pale faces with faintly glowing red eyes. They smiled at me, fangs unmistakable even from this distance. They rushed forward all at once. I hesitated only a moment before firing at them, shooting them each in the chest twice, just like I'd been taught. 
They went down in a ragged line, stretched out from the back wall to the archway. I breathed heavily, the loud reports of the gunfire echoing in my ears. The first one I'd shot stirred, pushing himself off the dirty floor. I gaped, watching idiotically as the second one did the same. And then the third. I had no time for disbelief, no room for doubt. Looking down at my gun, I thought about running. Then I remembered the piece of broken headboard next to the archway. I raised the gun and fired twice more at each of the creatures, hoping it would slow them down as much as the first shots had. I only had one round left in the gun, so I ejected the magazine and exchanged it with my spare. Moving toward the piece of furniture, I holstered my gun and stuck my flashlight between my teeth. I grabbed the piece of wood, snapping it in half on my knee. I now had a wooden stake in each hand. I stepped back to the archway, shining my light at the floor. The creatures were gone. In their place were only small splotches of blood. Something moved over my head and I looked up, illuminating one of the gruesome faces just as the creature dropped on me from the ceiling. I let myself fall, sticking one of the stakes up. As we hit the ground, the creature impaled himself on it, red eyes wide. He screeched before exploding into smoldering ash. Another creature was on me immediately too, wide mouth open, fangs glinting as it went for my neck. I dropped the stake in my left hand and used the appendage to stop the creature. My pinky and ring fingers accidentally slipped into his mouth and he bit down on them, severing them like they were nothing more than carrots. I had no time to consider what had happened. I jammed the other stake into his chest and he burst into ash. A third vampire grabbed me by the collar and threw me into the wall. I smashed into the brick structure face first, the flashlight in my mouth breaking a couple of teeth out before falling to the floor, but I managed to hold onto the stake. The remaining two vampires rushed me, one after the other. Although the flashlight had broken a couple of my teeth, it was still working fine. The device provided enough illumination for me to see the attack coming. I lunged up from the ground and jammed the stake through the first one's chest, then changed direction and hit the lone remaining creature with the tip of the stake that was sticking out of his comrade's back. They both burst into glowing ash. Knowing time was of the essence, I quickly grabbed the flashlight back up and swept it along the ground, hoping to see two things that belonged to me. Sure enough, there they were, around the area where I had killed the second vampire, my pinky and ring fingers. They hadn't turned to ash, despite being inside the vampire's body when I'd killed them. I swiped the fingers up with my good hand while holding the flashlight with the remaining fingers of my other. Upon stepping outside, I found that the rain had let up. I managed a crooked and bloody smile as I headed for the nearest hospital, my two fingers gripped gently in my hand. Where are you taking me? My younger sister giggled as she looked out the car window at the woods. I told you, it's a surprise. You'll see soon enough. Her face got suddenly serious, and she peered at me so intently that I had to slow down a bit on the dirt road to gaze back at her. Wait, she said. You're not taking me out to murder me, are you? My mouth dropped open and my eyes went wide. Uh, no. We both fell into laughter. <laughs> Tears streamed down my cheeks as I finally got myself under control, my gasps dying down. It was a good laugh with Serena. It felt like old times, better times. We lapsed into a comfortable silence as I steered the car down the narrow road, the headlights picking out little more than shapes from the trees. Then the structure came into view up ahead, the glowing lights of the towering mansion appearing through a gap in the foliage. Wow, Serena said. I wonder who lives there. You're about to find out, I said. No way. I nodded. You actually know the person who lives in that house? She asked. I nodded again. I met him a couple of months ago. The first person I thought of was you, when he invited me up and I saw it the first time. I know how you love these old mansions. I definitely do. I just wish it was daytime. I can hardly see the architecture. And why all this secrecy? Why couldn't I tell Simon and the kids where I was going? I rolled my eyes. I didn't want your husband worrying and calling you every five minutes. He's such a baby. My sister punched my arm and <laughs> laughed, 
Leave him alone. He's sweet. Just trust me, I said. There's more than just the house waiting. I promise. Ten minutes later, we pulled up to the unique mountainside mansion. There was a fountain in the middle of the circular driveway, red lights shining up from the water as it burbled away. After I'd parked, we got out of the car and marveled at the structure. There were three chimneys sticking up and two peaked towers with arch-style windows. The roofs were all steeply pitched, giving the house itself the appearance of some especially brutal mountain range. Looking at my sister while she babbled on in architect speak, I had a moment of regret. I suddenly wanted to tell her that plans had changed before whisking her back down the mountain. With some effort, I shoved my regret deep down, knowing that what came next would absolutely be worth it. It would be worth anything. I just had to keep my nerve for a little longer. I knocked on the heavy and ornately carved wooden door and waited. The door opened, revealing Horace in all his pale and handsome glory. A tall man dressed in an immaculate black suit with a red tie, Horace smiled without showing his teeth as he took us in with lively eyes. His brown hair was pulled back into a bun and his cheeks were clean shaven. Come in, Jackson. This must be your lovely sister, Serena. We stepped inside as Serena shook Horace's hand and gushed about his house. Thank you, he said. I spent many years perfecting the design. He led us through the house, which was draped in finery and decorated in dark hues. He came to a metal door, which he opened before standing aside, gesturing for us to enter. We're doing this now? I asked, suddenly sweating. Why wouldn't we? Horace asked. Doing what? Serena said. She seemed to sense that something was off. Maybe it was the pitch dark room waiting for us. Your brother has orchestrated a little surprise for you, Horace said, smiling again without showing his teeth. Serena hesitated. Please, he said. I'm sure you will quite like it. Serena walked into the dark room. I paused and looked at Horace. The edge of his lip twitched as his eyes bore into me. Swallowing, I walked into the room. Horace stepped inside after us, swinging the door shut and removing any source of light. But it was only dark for a moment before the lights came on. I gasped, looking around the room at the collection of severed human heads preserved in glass cases filled with liquid. What is this? Serena asked stepping close to me. This is the one room I never showed your brother, Horace said. What's going on, Horace? I asked. I brought her here. Now you keep your promise. What? Serena said. What promise? Horace finally smiled fully, revealing long and sharp bangs. Yes. Why don't you tell her? It's nothing, I said. Just a misunderstanding. Tell her! Horace shouted, his voice a growl as he rushed to me and grabbed me by the neck. Half choking, I said, I have a brain tumor, Serena. There's no cure. No cure but what Horace can give me. Serena was back against the only wall without shelves. She was shaking. What can he give you? She asked. Eternal life, (laughs) Horace said. He was ready to trade you to me for eternal life. No, my sister said. No. He wouldn't. You wouldn't. I looked at her, willing her to see my side of it. But there was no understanding in her eyes. Only the cold realization that Horace was telling the truth. All these people were trying to kill to attain immortality, Horace said, gesturing at the heads. They all wanted to deal with the devil. They may not have gotten what they wanted, but they got what they deserved. He lifted me off the ground by my neck. I felt the cartilage in my throat breaking as his cold hand clamped down. I kicked my feet and punched at him, but it was as if he was made of stone. Horace took something from his jacket pocket and poured it into my grimacing mouth. The coppery taste left no doubt in my mind as to what it was, but I didn't know why. Leave now and forget what you saw here, Horace said. He dug into my pocket and retrieved the keys, tossing them to my sister. Serena rushed out of the room a moment before I felt Horace's other hand on my skull. 
He was digging into the flesh of my neck with claw-like fingers, pulling one way on my skull and the other on my body. You know that old thing about vampires dying by decapitation? He asked me. Well, it's wrong. The head lives, you see. It can live forever. The pain came to a crescendo as skin and muscle ripped, followed shortly by the wet cracking pop of my spine settling. My vision tilted, the room spinning as my head fell down to crack on the concrete floor. My vision darkened. I tumbled through death, a savage existence where endless hands pulled at my very essence, ripping my soul apart and leaving only tatters. I was sure years had passed when my vision came slowly back and I saw Horace. He was lifting me up and dumping me into a jar on a shelf. Not all of me though. I could see my body on the floor, fresh blood all around it. The blood he'd poured into my mouth was his blood. He'd done it. He'd followed through on his promise. He turned me into a vampire. And then he'd taken my head. Hello, mom? The old Victorian style house is completely dark as I get home from my job at the coffee shop. It's strange because my mom's car is parked outside. I push the front door closed behind me, putting my keys away in my pocket before reaching for the light switch. Nothing, no lights. Mom? I call. It's a three story house, four if you count the cellar. Maybe she's up in the attic. Maybe she lost track of time. Or maybe she's down in the cellar, trying to get the lights back on. I never wanted to move here in the first place. I liked our old house. But my mom has a thing about Victorian fixer-uppers, and she's always wanted to do this. She'll take a year or so to fix it up and then flip it. Besides, I won't be living here much longer. At the end of summer, I'll be going off to college. Right now, I'm just trying to earn some extra money so I won't have to work during the first semester. Pulling out my phone, I turn the flashlight on and shine it around. Boxes are stacked everywhere in the huge living room. Our couch and chair are still coated in plastic wrap. Dropping my backpack, I head toward the cellar, opening the door to a gust of musty air. Mom? I call down. Nothing. I think about going down and looking around but the notion sends a shiver up my spine. No, I'll check the rest of the house first. The kitchen is nearby. I find a half-eaten plate of pasta on the table. It's cold, like it's been sitting out for a while. The chair next to the table is lying on its back. A lump forms in my throat. What the hell happened in here? My mom was eating and she got up in a hurry, but why? Did she get a call and have to go somewhere? But why wouldn't she take her car? With a mounting sense of dread, I searched the rest of the first floor and then head up to the second. No one lived in the house for many years before my mom and I moved in just days ago now. And the place is certainly in a state of disrepair. Every level is drafty and every floor creaky. So as I move up the stairs, each step is accompanied by a creak. As I reach the second floor, The flashlight on my phone times out, plunging me into darkness. A whoosh of air rustles my clothing as though someone just rushed past me, inches away. A chorus of whispered voices sounds from all around me. I can't understand the words. I get my flashlight back on and the voices stop. I look all around. There's no one there. My fear is getting the better of me. Stealing myself, I quickly search the rest of the house ignoring the tricks my mind plays on me. But I still find no evidence of my mother, and there's only one more place left to look, the cellar. At the top of the cellar stairs, I shine my flashlight down. I've just turned it off and back on so it doesn't time out again. I've been down there once before when we first moved in. I had to flip the breakers to help my mom figure out which ones were responsible for what portions of the house. Now I remember that creeping feeling I got while I was down there. I shrugged it off at the time. Now, all I want to do is run, but I can't. Not if there's a chance my mom is down there. So I step down onto the first stone step, and then the next. The stairs end a few feet from a stone wall, and the cellar opens up to the right. 
As I step off the last stone stair, I turn that way, shining the light into the space. My eye catches on the electrical panel, my heart jumping up into my throat. The panel has been torn apart. Wires stick out in all directions. Pieces of the black breakers litter the ground below. Matthew? My mom's voice is soft and almost apologetic, but why does it send a jolt of fear up my spine? I turn toward the sound, shining the light into the far side of the cellar. There's a narrow gap in the wall there, about two feet wide, that I don't remember being there before. Then I see the old chest of drawers that's been pushed to one side, revealing the gap my mom now stands in. What are you doing down here in the dark, mom? She smiles sadly, looking pale. Come here, Matthew. A creak sounds from directly above me, drawing my attention. Is someone else here? I ask, still looking up. I jump as I look back down, seeing my mother now standing just a few feet away. She holds a hand up, blocking my flashlight beam from hitting her face. Mom, are you okay? I'm just so hungry, Matthew, she says. Huh, hungry? Yes, she says, stepping toward me. I've never been so hungry. Something moves in the corner of the basement, just beyond the edge of my flashlight's illumination. Even as I step away from my mother, I look over her shoulder at the movement. I suddenly can't breathe. My eyes are so wide I feel like they're going to pop out of my sockets. The human-sized creature is hanging upside down from the ceiling in the corner. It unwraps mottled white and leathery wings from around its body, revealing a humanoid structure. Its skin is hairless and the same white gray as its wings. Its completely wide eyes shoot open and fix on me just a second before it screeches, opening its mouth to reveal a set of savage fangs. In the blink of an eye, it's no longer hanging upside down. It's racing toward me, wings flapping and arms extending. I turn and run, vaulting up the steps. When I'm a mere three steps from the doorway, another one of those human bat things sweeps in front of the door, screeching at me. My phone's flashlight times out, just as the three of them converge on me in the stairwell. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.